What's up, y'all? Welcome back to episode 19 of the Underestimated Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy. You are back with another episode. I bet y'all wasn't accepting a doubleheader today. Even though it is taking a little bit out of me to get this out for y'all. But I love y'all. It's all love. And I love doing this. So it's nothing to me. Because I'm doing what I love. I'm talking about sports. Or specifically hoops. So, as we all know. Damian Lillard is a Milwaukee Buck. Um, we know that for months now he has been trying to force his way, not just out of Portland, but more specifically to the Miami Heat to pair himself alongside Jimmy Butler and uh, Bam Adebayo. But that deal just simply uh, couldn't get done because apparently... The Portland Trailblazers just did not want Tyler Hero, which that is crazy to me because Tyler Hero is. Oh, let me do some. Let me do some some background check. So in about uh, four years, in his four year tenure with the Miami Heat, Tyler Hero has a forty. Forty we'll round up for him. Forty four percent field goal percentage, a thirty eight three point percentage, a eighty seven well eighty eight free throw percentage, five rebounds a game, four assists a game, about a steal a game, and averaging about eighteen points. And the thing is, Tyler Hero's only what twenty twenty three years old. You just bring in Scoot Henderson. You don't necessarily have a two guard to put next to him. I mean, you can say it's Shaden Sharp, but if you ask me right now, who do I want, who do I want? Tyler Hero, Shaden Sharp? I'm taking Tyler Hero. Um, but they just apparently did not want him. Tyler Hero has already won a Six Man of the Year award in 2022, and also was on the All Rookie Second Team in 2020. So I don't see how you don't want Tyler Hero, but that's that's the. Uh, the Trailblazers is this mistake. And according to Tyler Hero, he didn't want to be in Portland anyway, which I don't blame him because it's, it's freaking Portland, man. He wants to be in Portland. Anywho, it has been a little bit over a week since Damian Lillard got traded to the Milwaukee Bucks. And a pretty surprising deal because, I mean, what was crazy to me? Okay, so he got traded, according to this little thing I'm going to read to y'all in a minute, he got traded on September 27th. Which was the Wednesday before last. So two Wednesdays ago. So it was two Wednesdays ago. I don't know if that was then either Friday or the Friday before that. That Monday or Tuesday that I saw it, but as y'all know, you know, first take has been much better with Shannon Sharp on the show now, and Shannon Sharp, when they were talking about Damian Lillard, um, said, you know, he threw it out there, he was like, what about Milwaukee? What about the end of Milwaukee? And Stephen A. was like, I haven't thought about that, and that actually would be pretty great. And then look what happens about Three to well, one to three days later, he gets traded to Milwaukee. So, I still think this is my thing. the The point guard position is it really gives me a headache nowadays. Even when I'm discussing it now with y'all, with a friend, family member, whatever, because I want y'all to really think about what a point guard really is. To me, even though the guy is 6'9", the true definition to me of what a point guard always will be is Magic Johnson. That is what a true point guard would always be to me. Yes, the game has changed and evolved because of the last game, Green-Eyed Man and, and Golden State named Steph Curry. But there still doesn't change the fact that, to me personally, despite how much the game has changed, a true point guard to me in my eyes will always be Magic Johnson. 
That's why, even though regardless of how much I love Steph Curry, y'all you know, you know Steph Curry is my favorite player of all time. Well, him and Jordan is like one and one a for me, but Steph is not a true point guard. He's a point guard in today's game because how the game has changed. And yes, Steph can facilitate the ball and play make. I mean, he gets about four, five, six assists a night. That's that's great. But just because you can get assists and rack up assists don't make you a point guard. That I mean, anybody can do that. See, yeah, y'all get where y'all get where I'm going with this. And if you want to, you know, take the side out, I mean, you could say Chris Paul. Off the top of my head, is really like the only true point guard we have left in the NBA at this point. And he's like, wait, Chris Paul's like what six foot? Six one. And so this is my thing. Milwaukee won the championship, I think, with Drew Holiday at point guard. To me, what you come in the league as is what I will always regard you as. So even though Drew Holiday didn't win a, a championship at the point guard position, starting at that position, he will always, in my eyes, be a two guard. Drew Holiday, to me, is not a point guard. I'm sorry that it's just that's just that's just how I view it. So in my eyes, Milwaukee still did not have a point to guard. I do actually consider them a point guard. Not not for the true point guard perspective, but at least considering the fact that Drew Holiday is a two guard in my eyes. But if you look at Miami. The point guard position was the one spot that they have been, if you look at it though, have been lacking for years. Think about the last time the Miami Heat had a subliminally great point guard at the helm. But when you think about it though, have they really needed it? If you think about those LeBron James, D Wade, Chris Bosch years, of the Miami Heat. Their point guard was Mario Chalmers. I say Mario Chalmers is bad or a scrub. But that's a time where you had a lot of other great point guards around the league. Like Derrick Rose. Um, let's see. I didn't really think back, y'all. Chris Paul, obviously. Um, Rondo. I'm missing. I think Steve Nash may have still been playing. I, that could be. That could be wrong. Maybe some Jason Kidd years in there, maybe. I don't know. But, um. You so still had, if I just would, would retrieve it, you would have a, a great point guard selection there still. But let's see if we can try to retrieve that. Hold on. So right now it's Kyle Lowry. That's not bad, of course, but you look at where the league is trending. Kyle Lowry is like tier two, tier three in the league now of uh, point guards. So that's not your typical hooray if you're the Miami Heat, of course. Yeah, so looking at it, I don't believe the Miami Heat have had a all-star point guard ever. <laughs> Uh, you know, since like Tim Hardaway. And now looking at it, you know, Kyle Lowry's made a couple of all-star games in his career. But not obviously with the team. But, like I said, you know those years when they had Braun, Bosch, Wade, Shane Battier, Chris Anderson, Ray Allen, Mike Miller, etc. They didn't have a great point guard. It's Mario Chalmers. Well, I'm sure it was an average and over like 11 points a game, if that. So, does that say something about Jimmy and Bam? No, not necessarily, but you got to surround them with more. But Dame would have gave them that point guard, that perennial point guard that's just amazing. Because you look at how the the how I would rank point guards in this league, Dame, in my opinion, is number two right behind Steph Curry. You put them alongside, and then they I give them more shooting. 
you know, because now you have a a starting lineup that consists of would that be what Dame, Tyler Hero, small. I mean, Max Schroes is gone, so I don't know where that would put their small forward position at. Oh, Jim, Jim, sorry, y'all, Jimmy. Oh, well, according to this, it says that Josh Richardson is going to be the point guard, and they're going to put Jimmy at the four. So I guess I'm wrong on that. But I'm pretty sure it may go something like, it would have been something like uh, Dame, Tyler Hero, maybe like Jimmy, Kevin Love, Bam, or maybe even Caleb Martin, then Bam. I don't know about Jimmy at the four. I mean, Jimmy is Jimmy. Jimmy does magical and orthodox things, so maybe playing the four would be one of those things as well. But now they have this is just completely horrible for the Miami Heat. Now you lose a player that wanted to be on your franchise. A at a position that you have really not been superior in throughout the course of your tenure as an organization. You send him to a team that has already given you trouble at the most important time of the season in the Milwaukee Bucks in the playoffs. Even though I think they put them out recently. I think so. But still, all things considered, both teams healthy, they give them a, a hard time. And you let them get the play that y'all was supposed to get. Now you let Dame get shipped to Milwaukee. Put him alongside Giannis. And now healthy Chris Middleton. We, we don't know what version of Chris Middleton we're going to get. We don't know if we're going to get the all-star second option Chris Middleton or what. But we shall see. I think if he's at least 80%, I'd take an 80% Chris Middleton healthy. So yeah, Dame is a Milwaukee Buck. How do I feel? Well, as a Warriors fan, he ain't on the West Coast no more. So that helps us out in that regard. But the West is still tough, you know, whether he's there or not. It's just tougher with him on that side. But even though he really ain't been in, you know, playoff position in about four or five years. So that hadn't really affected us, him being on the West Coast. As of as of recently, but if we somehow find a way to make it to the finals, he may be there, and we get a step versus Dame final, which would be pretty great. Yeah, that's me. Now, I say this, you know, obviously on paper this team looks amazing. You got Dame, Chris Middleton. Giannis, Bobby Portis, Brooke Lopez. It's probably going to run things. But a couple of years ago, bring it back to my Warriors here. We had a top, well, a starter five that each player in that starter five was a top 10 player in their respective position. That lineup consisted of Steph Curry. Who was definitely a top ten point guard at the time? Obviously, top, top three, depending on you know how you stack it up. Clay Thompson, who was a top ten uh, shooting guard at the time. Kevin Durant, who was a top ten small forward at the time. Draymond Green, who at that particular time was a top ten power forward at the time. And then Boogie Cousins, who was a top ten center at the time. All of that team never got to really show what they were capable of because of injuries. I always tell people, you can have the five best players in the NBA on one team, right? You can have all-star team that we have. If the team does not gel and mix to its full capability, then it would just simply not be worth what we all thought it may be. 
And that's what I say about Milwaukee. I learned that the hard way. Cause I thought, I thought for sure, you know, me having a younger mind and not being as, you know, intelligent of a basketball mind as I am now. I thought for sure if all players on that team had played all 82 games that year, we wouldn't go 82 and 0. But um, the day we went like 63 and no, no, that wasn't that wasn't the same year. Nothing. That was the 67 and 15 team, I think. I think that was how we how we did that year. But anyway, I say this to say that yes, Dame on paper looks great on this Bucks team, but if this Bucks team does not gel to the potential expectation that we have for them, then it's, they're just going to underperform then, you know, to most of our likings. It's just the hard code truth. But like Dame said, you know, obviously it's obviously, you know, easier said than done. Them acquiring him puts defenses in around the league in a kind of a uh, two option mindset. You can either stack the, the paint and let Dame get, he said, what did, what did he say, like nine threes a game? I don't believe that's going to happen, but, you know, on any given night, probably six threes, you know, four to six threes a game. Or you can double team Dame and let Giannis get 30, 40 points in the paint. So teams will have to find a way to balance both containing Dame and Giannis. If I'm if I'm teams around the league, right, with, with me just now saying that, my objective every time I play against the Bucks is to make Chris Middleton beat me. If Chris Middleton comes up there and drops 40, 50, whatever, and we lose, okay, I can I can go to sleep at night. Just don't let it be Dame or Giannis. Make Chris Middleton beat you. Or Bobby Portis. But I would, you know, whatever, whatever. Make Chris Middleton beat you because if you're going to depend on letting Giannis or Dame beat you, it's not going to go very well. Now, if you say, I'll let Giannis beat me off the jumper, Giannis don't have a, doesn't have a consistent jumper, but I believe if he sees one or two go down, that confidence is going to skyrocket and he's going to start really pulling him. And he's gotten more and more comfortable with his jumper over the course of about the last two or three seasons. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily go down that route, but you know, teams may try it and see how well it goes for them. Where does this stack them up in the league? I think in the Eastern Conference, you know they could potentially be top three. Of course, some people saw this deal and immediately put them as the top team in the East. No, not necessarily. The way that Boston looks acquiring Drew Holiday and Christoph Porzingis, they look dangerous. I mean, that started five. It's monsters. Got Drew Holiday, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. Porzingis and probably Al Horford is how they're going to stack it up. Or is it probably going to end up being uh, um, Drew Holiday, Derek White, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Seth Porzingis. Either way it go, still great regardless. Boston actually scared a bunch of people when they traded guys like Grant Williams away. Um, then Robert Williams. But they've made up for it with getting two all-star caliber players in their respective positions and Drew Holiday and Princess Porzingis. And now that, you know, oh, also not to mention Marcus Smart shipping him off to uh, Memphis. Now on the defensive side of the ball, they can like lock in and actually become a cohesive defensive unit. They could be scary. They could definitely be scary. Um, so I would probably put them number one in the East right now. Making Milwaukee probably the 
solidified maybe number two lock. Um, so we're talking about the East here. So that's Boston, Milwaukee, Philly. I think Philly would be top six. And then we don't know what we have with James Harden. I think James Harden might be on the Clippers. And that's where he's at least trying to go. I don't know how that's going to work out, but that may happen. Um, obviously, you got teams like the Pacers, who I think are going to make some noise this year. Because I really love Tyrese Halliburton's game. And I really like the kid, Jarrett Walker, that they got from, uh, was that Houston? In like the, the fifth pick in the draft or seventh pick? Something like that. When I was top 10 for sure. Um, let's see, who am I missing here? Brooklyn may make their way into another playoff appearance. Ben Simmons looks like he could be back to being the Ben Simmons we all know and love. Um, Miami, of course, it's going to be a top four. Uh, who am I missing? I'm trying to do this without looking at the, um, the conference. Oh, uh, the Bulls, maybe. This playing thing is so, uh, so jacked up now. Like, I can be a 10th seed and work my way into the playoffs of the, just winning two playing games. That's just crazy to me. Um, but that's how they could stack up with the Eastern Conference. I think they could potentially be a top five team in the league in totality. That's definitely a, you know, on paper, we can, we can say top five teams in the NBA. I'm going to say, obviously, Phoenix, Milwaukee, Boston, the Nuggets, because you know, they're, they're, they're been the champs until, you know, the crown is taken from them. Wait, who was in the finals? It was Denver and... Was it Denver and Miami? No, right. Hold on, y'all. My mind is tweaking right now. It was the Heat, guys. I'm not tripping. It was the Heat. Yeah, so... um, Now let me kind of uh, read to y'all these two articles here. The first one being the the day of the Damian Lillard trade by The Athletic with a report by The Athletic staff with some input from Shams as well. Um, so it's titled, Damian Lillard traded by Blazers to Bucks in three-team deal involving the Phoenix Suns. The Portland Trail Blazers traded all NBA guard Damian Lillard to the Milwaukee Bucks in a three-team deal involving the Phoenix Suns. The team announced Wednesday the full trade involves the Blazers receiving Drew Holiday, DeAndre Ayton, and Tumani Kamara, the Bucks' 2029 first-round pick, and Bucks draft swaps in 2028 and 2030. The Suns are receiving Yusuf Nurkic, Nasir Little, Keon Johnson, and Grayson Allen. So this is just the, the trade um, broken down into simple terms. Just saying that the Bucks get Dame, the Blazers get Drew Holiday, DeAndre Ayton, Tumani Kamara, 2029 first, and Bucks pick swaps, and the Suns get using their guys and say Lou, Keon Johnson, and Grayson Allen. Now let me get to, well, I, I will actually. Let's read these. Yeah, we can yeah, we can read this. This is, seems pretty interesting. I could just read it for myself, but why not let y'all into it, right? All right, so for the books, it just says that how Dane will boost the books. For the books, Lillard represents a major swing for the fences. The seven-time All-NBA guard will immediately become the best player that two-time NBA MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo has shared the floor with and immediately from the Eastern Conference's most dangerous duo. Lillard just put together an All-NBA third-team season where he proved that he can still perform at an elite level with 32 points and 76 a game. 
So you bring a 32 and 7 Damian Lillard to the Bucks to pair him alongside Giannis. This is wow, this is gonna be the NBA is gonna be crazy this season. This might be the best NBA season we get yet. The Bucks now have two of the six players league wide who scored at least 30 points per game last season. So, okay, so Dame and Wow. Dame and Giannis both scored 30 points a game last season. That's 60 points by themselves a game. Oh my goodness. Okay, add in three time All Star Chris Middleton and Defensive Player of the Year when rep Brooke Lopez, and the Bucks just put themselves in position to be favorites in the East. I don't know why I'm reacting to this. Like, I'm so shocked. Like, it's. The trade isn't like over a week old. How will the uh, uh, oh my goodness, how will Lillard adjust in Milwaukee? As far as how things will work on the floor, things should be pretty seamless. The Bucks trade their star point guard to get Lillard, so he just needs to slot into holiday spot and then start a lineup. His addition will immediately add a new dimension to everything the Bucks do offensively. A lot of teams have long dared Bucks point guards to score in the pick and roll while up um, with Antetokounmpo. Lillard cannot be afforded such opportunities. Despite never playing together, Antetokounmpo and Lillard will, could end up being the league's most dangerous pick and roll duel overnight. Now they talk about the trade in totality with the Suns moving on from DeAndre Ayton, which we thought about, you know, kind of looking over between the past two and three years. Aiden has been the most discussed athlete in Phoenix for most of his time in the desert. The big man's talent has always been obvious. He has size, athletic ability, and shooting touch. What he lacked was a strong, consistent motor. Some nights, Aiden's skill set was intoxicating, but too often he left everyone wanting more. Upon introduction, new coach Frank Vogel said he looked forward to restoring Aiden to an all-star level. Oh, it would have been nice to see how Vogel's defense, defensive minded approach, and Peyton Aiden. It's not surprised that the organization was ready to move on. Entering his sixth season, Aiden set to make thirty-two million dollars this season. Is who he is. Nurkic may not be as talented at, and at twenty-nine, he's also four years older than Aiden, but he might be a better and cheaper fit alongside Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal. Now this is the last portion that exclaims, what now for the Heat? It felt like the Heat were all in on letting, on adding Damian Lillard this offseason, and losing out on him has left them in a precautious position. While Miami was able to summon all the strength of Heat culture and pull off a his historic run to the NBA Finals last season, this Heat roster in its current state doesn't look like it is built to repeat as Eastern Conference champs. While Tyler Hero is backing, while Tyler Hero is back after missing most of last year's playoff run, Max Struess and Gabe Vincent both left a free agency this summer. Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry are also a year, a year older. With the game, the Heat would have been one of the favorites to win the NBA title. Without him, the future looks very uncertain. Which is true. Which is very true. Now I want to kind of get into, I think it's kind of... Um, let's get into some financial things here with um Dame being traded to Milwaukee so I kind of want to read this for y'all this is a Forbes um article written by Brian Toperic a senior contributor this was also the day the day after Dame was traded to uh Milwaukee it says the Milwaukee Bucks saved the NBA trade market with their Damian Lillard deal so, nearly three months after he requested a trade from the Portland Trail Blazers, Damian Lillard finally got his wish Wednesday to some extent. The Blazers shipped him to the Milwaukee Bucks in a three-team blockbuster that radically reshaped the NBA hierarchy. 
in doing so, they revitalize, revitalize the league's trade market for the time being. When Lillard requested a trade on July 1st, he made it known that he only had eyes for the Miami Heat. His agent, Aaron Goodwin, advised other teams not to pursue a trade for him because he wanted to only play for Miami, according to Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald. Lillard's one-team trade request was relatively unprecedented. He just signed a two-year $121.8 million extension with the Blazers last summer, which meant he was on a guaranteed contract for at least three more seasons. Lillard's Miami or bus stance sapped the Blazers' leverage in trade negotiations as the Heat had little incentive to offer a fair value package if they thought they were the only bidders. In late July, the NBA sent a memo to all 30 teams that said any future comments made privately to teams or publicly suggesting Lillard will not fully perform the services called for under his player contract in the event of a trade while subject Lillard to discipline by the NBA. That didn't cause the rumor mill to stop cheering, though. Jackson and Anthony Shane recently reported that if Lillard is traded to a team other than Miami, he is better to ask to be traded to the Heat. Despite those reports, it seems as though Lillard is on board with his move to Milwaukee. And he just has a tweet that Dane made the day of the trade, basically where he said the casuals won't be addressed, but the Trailblazer fans and city of Portland that I love truly will be, and they will be addressed truthfully. Stay tuned. Excited for my new chapter at Bucks. Lillard wasn't the only player to issue a one-team trade request this summer. After picking up $35.6 million player option from the 2023-2024 season, the Philadelphia 76ers guard James Harden made it known that he wanted to be traded to the Los Angeles Clippers. Sorry, I refash y'all. I talk fast as well. Unlike Lillard, Harden's trade request remains unfulfilled for the time being. If he wants that to change, Harden may have to take after Lillard and widen the scope of which teams he's willing to join. Trade talks seemingly never got off the ground between Portland and Miami, according to multiple reports, while the Sixers ended trade talks with the Clippers in mid-August, per ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Once Lillard's camp realized that they were stuck at the at a dead end, Goodwin privately told the Bucks and Brooklyn Nets in mid-September that he would be interested in a deal there, per Mark J. Spears of Anscape. Less than two weeks later, the Bucks leapfrog the Heat to acquire Lillard. The Lillard trade saga should teach both disgruntled players and their agents a valuable lesson. Teams hate being backed into a corner. One team trade requests are far less likely to be fulfilled unless that team has a treasure trove of assets that it's willing to dangle. Otherwise, a player risk being stuck in trade purgatory until his contract expires or he expands his list of destinations. Had the Blazers caved and taken a subominal return from Miami, other stars would inevitably follow suit with their own trade requests. The Bucks did the league at large a favor by not scaring off, by not being scared off by Lillard's heat or bus stance but they did themselves a favor too. This summer, Bucks megastar Giannis Antetokounmpo made it clear that he was suddenly questioning his own long-term future in Miami. Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, and Brooke Lopez were all along the wrong side of 30, and the Bucks' title window appeared to be closing within the next few years. Now let me just make, make a comment before I continue reading. I found it so funny that the minute Giannis came out and said, you know, I want to be a Milwaukee Buck for life, but at the end of the day, I'm a winner first. And if I'm not in a winning situation, I will, you know, explore all options to go be a winner and compete for a championship. The minute Giannis comes out and says this, in no time they go get Dame. <laughs> in no time they go out and require Dame. It was like, we're not letting this happen. Like, we're not letting Giannis go without a fight. And they immediately go acquire Dame Lillard to keep him happy. Because he knows that with Dame on his team, um, they have a chance to be winners. 
and I expect him to be very successful for years to come. And if you look at it, Dame and Giannis kind of have had mutual respect between one another for some years because Dame said years ago, if you could play with one person in the league, who would it be? He said Giannis. And now look, he's playing with Giannis. Um, Lillard just turned 33 in July, so age remains a long-term concern for Milwaukee. But Antetokounmpo should no, should no longer have to worry about whether the Bucks are all in on pursuing championships. He still might not sign an extension until next summer when he'll be eligible for a four-year deal worth an estimated $244.9 million, according to the sport tracks Keith Smith, but he's likely to far less of a free agent flight risk in 2025 that he seemed to be a few weeks ago. That's bad news for Miami and other suitors that were lining up to pursue into the Kumpo, including the New York Knicks. They'll now have to turn attention elsewhere, whether to Harden, Holiday, whom the Blazers received in the Lillard trade and reportedly hoped to reroute elsewhere, or another disgruntled star down the line. That's great news for the NBA trade market at large, though. Had the Bucks stood pat and not going on a deep playoff run in 2023-2024, speculation about Antetokounmpo's future would have reached a fever pitch. Teams interested in trying to acquire him might have been more risk-adverse with other trades in the meantime. As they as they need to preserve as many assets as possible. That could have ground the star trade market to a halt for the next two years. With Anthony Kupo now likely off the market for the time being, teams can pivot right away. Six of center Joel Embiid and Dallas Mavericks guard Luka Doncic are the two names worth monitoring in that regard, although neither player has indicated that a true request is imminent. If Embiid, Doncic, or another megastar does eventually request a trade, the other deal could also help reset the market after the Minnesota Timberwolves' ill-advised acquisition of Rudy Gobert last summer. That deal set an unrealistic baseline for any star trade, as the Wolves gave up four first-round picks, a first-round pick swap, Walker Kessler, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, Patrick Beverly, and Leonardo Balmaro for him. The Gobert trade happened under the NBA's previous collecting Collective bargaining agreement, but some of the changes in new CBA increased the value of trade of draft picks. The Bucks had already traded away their 2025 and 2027 first round picks and swapped rights in 2024 and 2026 for Holiday. Ironically, so all they could offer Portland was their unprotected 2029 first rounder and swap rights with in 2028 and 2020 and 2030. Under the old CBA, that might not have been enough draft competition to get the Blazers to agree. But since they're looking to flip holiday, presumably for more picks and or younger prospects, and acquired 2018 number one overall pick DeAndre Ayton in the Lillard deal, they, they didn't need an outrageous number of picks to part ways with Lillard. Rebuilding teams like OKC, the Utah Jazz, San Antonio Spurs can assemble pick-heavy packages that blow other suitors out of the water. But thanks to the Lillard deal, contenders now have hope that they can still join the bidding for stars even if they aren't overflowing with future picks. Rival teams are unlikely, wait, rival teams are likely despondent about the Lillard and Tedekumpo pairing in Milwaukee and what it meant for their short-term title hopes. But the Bucks have restored some much needed equilibrium to the NBA trade market, which should behoove the whole league moving forward. So that kind of uncovers my thoughts on the Dame trade, how that affected the league in totality and certain teams like the Milwaukee Bucks, Portland Trailblazers, Phoenix Suns, Miami Heat, etc. Um, Boston Celtics, you know, whatever, whatever. So, That's it for me. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Let me know down in the comments what are y'all's opinions on the Dame trade. And I'll be there to look at it and see what y'all got to say. Always remember, don't underestimate, appreciate. And without further ado, I'm gone.